afternoon, everybody. I, I would like to thank the British Entomological and Natural History Society and the London Natural History Society for inviting me to deliver the 2020 Brian Ashby Memorial Lecture. It's a privilege to be asked to do so and have the opportunity to talk to you about caddis and biological recording. The talk includes short recorded interviews with, in order of first appearance, Martin Harvey of Biological Record Centre, Craig McAdam of Bug Life, Sharon Flint of the Caddis Group at the Freshwater Biological Association, and Mike Howe, Invertebrate Specialist from Natural Resources Wales. I'm very grateful for their contributions. Just for the record, I'm closely associated with World Museum Liverpool and the Freshwater Biological Association, which greatly helped in all my work by the Biological Record Centre, NBN and the Antoniptera Trust. The talk this year is delivered from the Caddis Recording Scheme headquarters, which is actually a dining room on the Wirral, there to be precise. And I'm greatly assisted by Holly and Kieran from uh, Biolinks. The principal themes of the talk about what we might add to records, gaps in our knowledge of Caddis biology, which could be filled, and the general idea about what direction one might be going in Caddis recording. That's about 75 minutes with a short recorded and, uh, and that includes the interviews and there's a comfort and refreshment break about halfway. This is the basis of the, the talk really. The distribution atlas which uh, I'm writing with uh, Jim O'Connor of Ireland, hopefully to be published at the end of 2021, fingers crossed. Recording schemes are notorious for always wanting to stretch it a bit more. The Irish maps have already been published and I'm grateful to Jim for agreeing to uh, join me with the British Isles Atlas. But that immediately begs the question which all recording schemes ask, what do we do after the Atlas? The records are going to be continued to accumulate, so what might we be adding, be able to add to them to, to increase their value? Well, the first thing I want to do is to improve spatial resolution. I mean, I looked at some of my early BRC cards and that was one of them. I mean, we had to aggregate level uh, data to a, a hectare level because the system couldn't cope with anything better. I'm currently running on an eight figure standard, which you can work out with a ruler and a bit of string. But things have greatly changed with the GPS. You know, when these first came out, I thought, gosh, it stands for gosh, pretty slick. Until you have to sit around waiting for the satellites to join up. That certainly allows you to increase all the way up. And I wonder where it will actually end. Is this going to be something in the future that we have to base with, you know? Are we really going to reach that, that level? A slight dig at what I think is sometimes pseudo uh, accuracy of the GPS. But certainly you can assign those records so easily now with, uh, with maps. And it's really good to have a very good location. Because obviously you can relocate the exact spot but it's the great thing is that you can add on these days all layers of information um, automatically. So the recorder doesn't have to do anything to add on lots of, uh, of layers if somebody wants them added. But what else might uh, we record? And what got me thinking was this lady, Edita Buczynska. I was sent one of her papers to review. Uh, she was the senior author on this one. And her paper was really all about this caddisfly, Eretis uh, boldica, fairly nondescript, but a, a, a unique case. And that's where it occurs in this country. And the reason I've bolded Norfolk Broads north of, of the year is that's the only place in the country where it's been common. Anyway, Ditter's argument was that we don't often meet rare species, so therefore it's worth recording as much as we can about what they are in case it proves to be really important. But if you can't record everything, what should we focus on? Well, the first thing you might think about would be physical things to record at the same time. And there, an, an idea of some of the physical things you might actually easily add on. But the value of those, well, if you're just a one-off recording visit, I have doubts, honestly, um, about whether it's feasible to do most of those, because a lot of them vary throughout the day. But if you're going back several times, I think certainly water chemistry and the times of the survey would be worth adding on. Capture method is certainly something very definitely, which uh, I think we should add to, to records. For example, 
that, that and that are relying upon knocking off an individual where they actually are into a net. Whereas that, a light trap, is a good example of one which is attracting things in to the trap from, uh, from afar. And then there were pitfall traps and malice traps. The malice trap is often um, uh, said to be a non-attractive trap. Uh, but we put it, one up in a marsh. Um, hundreds of this little Cladisperia pilata, all females, um, were caught. And I think they were climbing up structures to probably pass out, out pheromones. And the malleus trap was a, a gigantic um, thing to climb up. Pitfall traps might seem to be very unlikely for the caddis, but actually, if you happen to put pitfall traps in the marshes where this extremely rare caddis lives, you're likely to pitfall trap quite a few larvae. Because the pools in the marsh are quite small, we thought at one time, the reason is, is the pools are drying up and they're, and they're walking in between pools. And that might be the case, but actually, I think it's on the hunt. Look at those front legs. It's a predator and grows rapidly. And there's almost nothing except a few dead leaves in the pools it lives in. So I suspect that actually it's on the roam for, for things to eat, of which other caddis species are probably quite um, common. So at this point, I thought it was worth actually um, asking other people. And the first, people, the first one I thought I would ask would be Martin Harvey. The Biological Records Centre has traditionally been the place where records were processed to end up as atlases, but they do more than that with the data. So I asked Martin Harvey, the BRC, to outline some of their work. Um, yeah, sure. So, um, BRC, the Biological Records Centre, um, is part of the UK Centre for Ecology and Hydrology, and the, the BRC element of that has been in existence for over 50 years now, 55 years, I think it is. Gosh. Um, and, uh, and as you say, we've, throughout that time, we've, we've worked very closely with um, the national recording schemes and the Atlas production that the schemes have um, initiated and we've been able to support over the years has been uh, a big part of that. Um, but I, yes, as, as you also hinted at, Ian, the, the use of the data and the, the, the role of the schemes in where that information ends up being used does go much wider than that. And for me, I think it's um, one of the, the sort of big things about this partnership, if you like, between the schemes and the BRC is the, the link that it enables to the wider research community I mean, to take this fantastic set of data, the records that are collected by lots of individual recorders and are then brought together by the schemes and checked and quality controlled and all those sorts of things then that can then feed into some really quite broad research topics and things like um, the effects of um, invasive species, the effects of climate change, links to use, and indeed to government policy. That's another strand of where the, the data goes, is to inform some of the, the indicators and the, the, the tests, if you like, that government um, looks at itself to in the sort of wider environmental context. So there's some, some really important and very intriguing links there that go all the way from people recording in the field right up to the national and international topics. It's good to hear how potential value of records is exploited. So I asked Martin how we might make them even more valuable. So I think one of the, the things that we are currently looking at that um, does offer some quite exciting possibilities is whether we can gather more information about how records have been collected and what the borders were actually doing at the time. And I could imagine, um, I, I do a little bit of caddis fly recording myself, but I'm not, I'm not, I'm not a great caddis specialist in any sense or form. So the sort of records I tend to collect tend to be the odd sightings here and there when I run off track and I see some caddis flies, I'm, I'll try and record some of them. But that's a very different sort of recording to somebody who's gone out specifically to do a caddis fly survey and tried to find a complete range of species. And I think both of those types of recording are really, really useful and you can add dots to an atlas map and can be used in other ways, but could be even more useful if we captured a bit more information about the amount of effort that's gone into making the record and the context in which it was collected. 
that uh, not in recording effort it sounded a good idea but uh, I asked Martin how he thought it might be done in what what ideas of other recording schemes or other recording that you could come up with that might assist this um, analyzing recording effort or actually just simply recording how much effort you put into getting the record I mean have other people tried this um, I, there, there are some examples, and I think perhaps one of the most well established in this area is um, in the context of bird recording. Oh, yes, right, yes. Yeah. That, that is, certainly happens on the, the bird track system. Is there some idea of asking people to say whether their records represent a complete list of what they've seen at a particular place and time, or whether it is just a sort of one off sighting or a few birds of interest rather than a complete list? And I know that um, the British Trust on Ethology and other people who work with that data have, have used that very successfully. And one of the one of the things that the complete list idea gives you is a, um, more information about if something hasn't been recorded, was it yes. because you were there, or was it because you didn't have to write it down at the time? Um, so it, it it definitely throws some light on that and enables some some. To, um, analysis and some better interpretation to be made of what the records are telling you and that 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 works really well for birds even becomes a bit more problematic for some of the invertebrate groups i think yes. um yes we need to think about it <laughs> yeah and we yeah, do and particularly when we where you've got things like the, the fact that some invertebrate groups do require specimens to be identified and the idea of a complete list, I think, becomes more problematic then because a lot of it does depend on how many things you've taken away to identify, how much microscope time there is, as well as in the field. So, as you said, Ian, it does become quite complicated. Um, but I think there's this, and there's another approach you can take, like just recording the, the, the hours of effort that have gone into a particular day, or saying a bit more about the particular sampling methodology, whether you've been doing aquatic sampling with a, a yeah. net you've been um, just focusing on the adult um, insects all those sorts of bits of information can help as well but i don't think what, what, I, what I, i'm not aware of and i think what might be a really interesting thing to look at is whether there are some slightly more standardized approaches yes. with this that would um, add value to the data that's already been collected i mean i, I spoke to mike Howe of uh, national resource and Wales, who was very concerned with um see, site designations and um, his answer to, to what we would be, be most useful to add on is um, very much a similar similar answer, but in a slightly different way. He said that we would love to know numbers of specimens, but of course, um, numbers of specimens is, is obviously tied in with the with the amount of effort. Uh, so you also have to record, as you suggest, you know, uh, exactly how much effort did you did you put in to find your your five red ones or your single red one. Right. I think there was a clear message um, from uh, Martin's interviews that I'm very grateful for, that you can record, um, you could greatly enhance them by recording intensity of survey effort, not only numbers of specimens, but the methodology needs a lot of thought. So my, my mind that then turned to what about adding habitat descriptions? Some of the small invert schemes do uh, add habitat descriptions and um, give you a chance to do so. That's the one from the maybe pod and isopod group. And you could um, add that sort of information to every record you wanted to. And they certainly make use of it. For example, um, that's from their website and these are things like an analysis of the habitat data from the recording scheme. So what might we add most usefully for CADIS? And I think I'll start off with the problems if it's adults, well, where did the captured ad observed adult actually come from? If it's immature, it's, well, those sites vary a lot in size. Where was the microhabitat? So I think the habitat descriptions for one-off visits, I think the basics would be useful and habitat photograph. For repeat visits, then certainly water habit flow, habitat, microhabitats, and I think I wonder if we should be moving to an era of taking videos rather than individual photographs. I'm uh, persistently disappointed at the photographs I've taken of sites. Uh, they just don't reflect them properly. Now, another idea is to record what, what other species 
um, where it were taken at the same time. Caddis recorders usually um, supply a full list, but other groups just get recorded elsewhere. But we can get them by linkage with the grid reference, hopefully. One of the groups which is where it's, this is proving very successful is this. Um, Steve um, French's Moth Trap Intruders uh, Facebook pages, where caddis feature very frequently, and um, it's a good example of collaboration. Obvious candidates at this, to record at the same time as caddis are mayflies and stoneflies that with caddis form an artificial group called riverflies, a name that has caught the public imagination and thus has value for conservation. So at this point, uh, and that is, uh, I thought I would ask Craig McAdam of Bug Life for his views. Do you think there is um, merit in trying to um, look for a recording of, um, of river flies as a group by amateurs as opposed to the professionals who, of course, do it all the time? I think there is. Um, certainly, you know, because they occur in the same habitats and, you know, you know the, the same methods are used to collect them, yeah. you know, you, you're going to get a tray full of these things and some of them out of the way just to record on one team seems a bit, a bit silly, really. Um, I think that, you know, if you're, if you're looking at caddis flies, um, you're, you're going to see may flies, you're going to see stone flies, you're going to see a whole lot of other things as well. Um, and I think our, our, our role is to um, perhaps, um, you know, if you're, if, you're, if you're looking at caddis flies, just to give some of the easy wins, if you like, yes. on the other ones, you know, so you've got a big stone fly there, it's, it's got scary armpits, it's Carlo, Alicompatra, Dynacrus, yeah. you know, so dead easy to do in the field. Um, I think once you start asking people to then take back a lot more material to identify at home or, or elsewhere, that's when it, it, it becomes more, more of a, a, a burden on them, if you like. Yes. Um, but if we can give them things that they can say, oh, I know that one because Ian told me or Craig told me or whoever told me, yes. it's that one. I mean, that's what I do with caddis flies, you know, so I'll, if I'm doing a course on uh, mayflies or stone flies, I'll pop it out, a uh, circus stone or person at them, dead easy to identify in the, in the tray and say, well, you know, that's that, because it looks like that. Elliot, um, I think you were going to say, are we promoting the river flies as a group as um, a way of, of helping conservation of fresh waters? Are we doing um, enough of that? We probably need to do more of that. Um, conservation tends to focus on a single species and not look at the, the wider picture, I suppose. Um, the fresh waters are slightly different in that we do look at assemblages more. We think about the, the whole river and we think about um, uh, everything in the river, but I think it's useful to have some flagship species, some species you can say this is a species of yes, that is true. Yes. Its waters, or this is a species of fast flowing rivers, and and then say, but there's all these other species around about them. I think promoting river fly conservation is something that we wanted to do for years, and we've tackled with some of the um, UK bat species. Yes. Yeah, we're still really looking only at single species, we weren't looking yes. at the whole, yes. the whole assemblage. Um, so the interview with Craig suggested strongly to me that adding easy hits um, in the river flies and that we spend time thinking how we could contribute more generally to uh, freshwater conservation. So a summary of what we might ask recorders to add, good grid reference, the Celtic method certainly, recording effort if we can refine that, the numbers seen, the basic habitat descriptions and easy hits. I've mentioned before. But remember, it did a Wojcinska suggestion, record as much as you can if you find a rare species. Well, actually, I have a solution to that. If you find a rare species on a one-off survey, try and get back and have more information. Well, that was the end of part one, but unfortunately, it's a little bit early for a, a break. So I'll go straight on to part two.
which is more than dots on maps. What do we really know about the biology of our caddis? I'm writing species accounts for the atlas, and um, that's a good um, starting point to look about what we know about the biology. And it's a bit of a shock, really. For most of the genera of caddis, we might know a little bit about some species, but nothing or almost nothing about a lot of other ones, which could bring a bit of air uh, of gloom. Until I was quite heartened by a recent article in Antenna on Anopheles gambiae. Now, this is probably the world's most important insect in the fact that it kills thousands and thousands every year by the malaria it, it carries. So mega important insect, even more important than some caddis, I would have to admit. But yet this article indicated, and it was very uh, sophisticated what they were trying to do to, to, to get rid of these things. This interesting remark, surprisingly little known about, about where it spends the summer. So I thought, you know, if quite significant elements of the biology of something as important as Anopheles gambiae aren't known, perhaps it's not such a serious worry about caddis. Of course, not all factors are of conservation significance, but some of the critical factors, and I'll start off with, with the adults, so all of those could be quite important from a conservation point of view if you mess them up. I want to say something about adults and caddis. In the past, the adult stage, that was the time when you when you took your holidays because the adult was around and, the, and, the, and there weren't any larvae in, in your studies. Adults were just considered a source of eggs and their conservation requirements really were not appreciated. It was all about water quality and the aquatic habitat. So the one I want to pick out straight away is of a position. Really important because the female's got to do it in the right place. And gravid females are the least numerous of any of the life stages. But imagine you're a caddis and you want to get your eggs in that stream. Look at the microhabitats you might use in by as far as water depth concerns, size of stone you might lay on, water speed, um, if you, you might want to go on plants or whatever. In other words, there's a huge lot of microhabitats. Fortunately, evolution has chosen, for example, in this case, that you look for broken water flowing at a certain speed and, and you have ways of measuring that, protruding stones and so on. In other words, you've actually evolved that. And the example I'm going to choose about what happens if you go wrong is actually a butterfly. And I hope I won't be uh, told that this is all old hat now, but it's essentially that lays on milk parsley. And if you let the surrounding vegetation grow so it overtops the milk parsley, the butterflies can't really see where the plant is to go and lay on them. So that is clearly mega important. Remove the queue and you might stop off a position. So that's of high conservation significance. It's not all entire gloom. For example, there's four species of Rhycophila, and that's the adults. They all look more or less like that. And that's the egg mass of one of them. So are the other three species likely to be the same? Well, the, the ovipositors look more or less the same shape, so it's likely they're laying it in the same way. But then we have a slight problem. Um, we only know it's for one species, and two authors talk about the female crawling under a stone to lay. And another one mentions about it actually goes and finds moss at the side of a stone and probes its, its abdomen in the moss and lays that, that way. So we're not absolutely certain on, on those things. I want to introduce... Um, probably one of the most studied caddis of all um, in the British Isles. On the right hand side, Plexiglomia conspersa and its um, predatory larva. And to also introduce you to the Broadstone stream, this rather uninspiring stream is probably one of the most studied of all streams in the UK, thanks to the work of Professor Alan Hildrew. And they've studied Plexiglomia conspersa and its egg laying, but the interesting thing was that several females can choose a, the same stone and they could not find any reason why they would choose a particular stone and not another. Interestingly, nothing was published about the courting and mating. One paper said it took place in the dark and we couldn't therefore observe it. We get eggs, so it must happen. So our ignorance is insignificant. Well, you know, I wonder. Mass laying seems to be quite common. Here's a beautiful caddis, which unfortunately you in the southeast of England will not get a chance to see very often. 
like so many caddises, a northern and western species. But that mass of egg laying. But sometimes you do wonder how far we can take things. This, this is uh, responsible for the little tortoise shaped cases in streams, Acapetus fuscopes. It's got a very complex courtship. Oh, it involves pheromones and sound and aggression and running up and down. And its egg laying is even more peculiar. The female crawls down underwater along the side of a stone and she would choose a large sand grain, which she will carry in her forelegs to another stone. And she will then find, um, she will have measured exactly how big this stone is she's carrying. So she lays just the right number of eggs to then um, stick this capstone, as it's called, over the top of them as the as, um, protection. So, what can we say about its relatives? Well, the family Glossisomatidae has four common species, and you can see from the maps they really are common. And yes, so what do we know about the courtship and um, and egg laying of these species? Well, Agapetus um, hocropes. We know that the sexes meet up on tall bankside vegetation. One observer. Glossisoma adults plaster their eggs under the rocks, but you know that's pretty basic information and a lot which we which we don't understand which if we messed up could affect that species we have some idea that the female glossosoma has flattened middle legs so we uh, think that that's and um, suggest that they probably land on the water surface and actually swim down using those um, flattened middle legs it could be argued what am i going on all this information for because a desperate female will eventually lay somewhere probably unsuitable. Anybody who, who keeps Lepidoptera knows that the dying female will, will lay her eggs, usually even if she's um, um, a virgin. But we know that also things like flies, they'll die egg bound, in my experience. But if a recorder does come across something unfamiliar in you know, with egg masses, it is worth um, trying to find out what they are, rearing those things. And behavior of the newly hatched larvae it's also very important. Some of them, but not others, are planktonic. But before of a, of a position comes mating, we don't know much about that either. You know, I had to go to the thesis of, um, uh, of my old friend Peter Barnard to find any pictures of coupled together caddis. It's a very uh, complex arrangement of things. And coupling is very difficult to, to uh, study. I was told that the way you did this was you found a mating pair and poured liquid nitrogen over them. So we don't hear this from field naturalists. I'm afraid liquid nitrogen doesn't come in, 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 in little bottles. Anybody who's had uh, virgin female envermoths know that you can attract large numbers of males um, and the males arrive. But then suddenly the actual mating seems to be all, all, it's sort of instantaneous and the male will arrive, bang, and then it's done. The internal operations you might have to then do might take a lot longer. But the sequence from not coupled to coupled is even more difficult to observe. Is this a conservation gap? Well, you could say, well, once it gets as far as that stage, how the bits fit together is not really important. We'll just assume it works OK. The male key should only fit the right female lock. But the trouble is, we spend enormous energy trying to find the differences by looking at male keys. There's much less work being done in the females, because especially in the caddis, they're very soft. But actually, I was quite heartened by this micro CT scan technology, which should be able to give us a better picture of what, what it actually is like inside a, a female caddis. It should be the last barrier to stop mating between species, but what are really are the important differences? For example, take these three Leptocerus species in Britain radically different males, but the females are quite similar. But there again, here's another species, a European species, Wormaldia occipitalis. That bit varies across Europe. But is that significant for, for, for mating? I really don't know. I would hope that increased knowledge, what, when, what the mating structures really are doing, would help conservation because endemic subspecies rank very highly in conservation. And it'd be nice not to have to use DNA all the time but before mating comes courtship. And that's going to be very complicated. But again, the evolved tool, you know, evolution has come to the, to the aid. And you have an idea about where um, 
you would be best suited to do your courtship. But again, if you remove the mating site, it could be of high conservation performance. Each stage is a test. And in fact, if we regard these as a mating pair, I mean, the female has got to say that all the time. You know, you'd just be wasting your resources, Gondi. I'm not your type. I'm afraid the female insect can't say, look, I'm awfully sorry. I know you've put a lot of effort into all this coupling, but, but I realize now you're not my type. So can you please uncouple? No, I'm afraid the male's got to be stopped quite a bit before that stage. It's easy to get uh, uh, anthropomorphic, but I, I do like the mating etiquette of two contrasting uh, longhorn cutters. Mestacities, the modern approach, right? The, the female approaches the, this one. The male grabs her gently by his maxillary pulps, and they both fly uh, together to um, the bank where he will then um, finish mating. Should the wind blow and land them on the surface of the water, they would both take efforts to, to become airborne again. Unlike the old fashioned approach of Athropsoges, the female approaches the swarm and the male Athropsoges will immediately grab her and couple with her. She will then stop flying and he then has to carry her ashore. Should he run out of, run out of energy and they land up on the water surface, she will attempt vigorously to uncouple because he has, in a very real sense, failed the male fitness test. Swarms might seem to be good, but by gum life in them is, is very tough. It's usually the outside individuals who mate, and they're likely to be the, the freshly emerged ones. But after a while, after bashing each other about, they soon become just part of the sort of core de ballet in the middle, ever hopeful, but really just um, assisting, making a good spectacle. And this is the general approach. The female approaches the swarm seen by a male and she's grabbed, but it takes place at night. So let's study and let's see what we see at night. There it is. There is a large mating swarm of cutters in that space, I assure you. So I think actually cheap night vision um, devices could be the next big step for field etymology. So it's worth recording courtship behavior, where it is, the weather, the interaction of the players and so on. Where does coupling take place? And this was studied, this was a whole thesis where it was one of the major subjects of that thesis. So we'll move from adults to larvae, but if everybody is in, is in agreement, I think this is time for, for a break. Okay. Am I off? Yes, off I go. So we're now going to look at possible critical factors for larvae, now, which is behavior of the, of the newly hatched larvae, the resting side and so on. Not as many as the adults, which might be a surprise. Perhaps there's a few more. <laughs> but of those factors, we can often fill in, in the gaps for individual species by what we know from their residents but we don't know a lot about some of the fine detail. But I mean, it can be quite difficult. Imagine stream, just micro habitats. You've got the depths, you've got flow, you've got where you might be on a stone, you might be in the gravel, you might be on roots or different parts of plants. All quite complicated. Now, one particular subject, you might think, oh, well, surely feeding will be um, an area where there will be a lot of specialization. You'll remember Lepidoptal larvae. They're just general chewers, but they're very choosy in what they'll eat. So they're not very op opportunistic, but that by co-evolution, we've got 180,000 world species. Caddis, well, just a few general types of feeding method. Um, and they're quite adaptable in the food they can use. But that means that being opportunistic and adaptable They've only evolved 14 and a half thousand world species. One of the important foods is this material, um, Aufwux or whatever it is, a nutritious layer which grows on anything in water as opposed to on land. It's bacteria, um, single cell plants, um, fungi and so on. And it does grow on absolutely everything. 
It's a term which was invented by a German um, lindologist over a hundred years ago. And a lot of freshwater biologists would like it because it, it really summarizes a complex entity. Uh, but you do have to be a little careful if you're using the German pronunciation of Oh, folks, that people do not think you've said something else unfortunate. Which is probably why Peter Hiley, who introduced me to it, and Caddis, used the cringing pronunciation of Oh, folks. And that's the one I would use. It has got a new term, periphyton, but that to me um, seems to suggest only a plant element. But perhaps that's what we're going to have to use post Brexit. Dead leaves are full of fungi and bacteria that decay them. Dead wood too. And these bits can be broken off and carried by currents. And they can be caught in very specialised nets made by some caddis like Hydropsyche for coarse stuff, Philippotamidae for small stuff. Tangle traps, which are used by the polycentrophodids to catch other animals. Bacchocentris, the granum, grabs things. And of course, the other great advantage is that our old friend, Elfwux, may grow on the traps as supplementary food. So what a caddis larva eats and what it digests are two different things, really. And you see that it's quite simple. Algae, bacteria and fungi and Elfwux really are a very major element of food of a large number of caddis. There are some specialist feeders. This is one I like the best of all. These larvae of the Psychomyidae walk over the surface of rocks and they keep themselves covered by a long sort of meandering gallery so that they can't be seen as they scrape little algae off the surface of the, of the rocks. But it's been recently found that these tunnels are rather like a greenhouse polytunnel and algae grows on the inside of these galleries and there's a major food source for many of these. Oh, I see the swallow midge larvae hole and this one um, they eat freshwater sponge. I mean, it must be like eating a glass fiber sandwich, but they have guts specially adapted to cope with the fact that they're swallowing such a lot of um, sponge spicules. Life cycles, what do we need to know about those? Larva growing times, um, life stages and so on. They're important things we need to, to know to conserve species. So if we add those together, what's extra to add to larval records? And I think those are worth adding. Um, but it's, it is a matter of, of time. You know, what time do you have available to do that? What about pupae, you might say? Well, the um, pupa is very interesting in, in, in caddis. Um, the adult is an active adult in a thin pupal skin, and it will be able to move parts of the pupal skin to cut itself out of the case and swim to the surface. I know it's a bit passe now, but I used to describe it as being rather like the man in the Dalek, uh, me move things on, on the inside, from the inside. And they swim to the actual surface where the thorax um, will break contact with the water film, break through, and the adult will then emerge from there. Some of them swim ashore to then um, land somewhere more firm before they will then split and the adult comes out. You're left behind with the um, pupil shuck, as it's called. You know, it's interesting, the key to, uh, to caddis pupae is about 60 years old and there was no key at all to caddis pupil shucks because they weren't really considered um, important. Vitally important if you're a fly fisherman um, where the, uh, because huge numbers of caddis die uh, by being swallowed by fish at that um, at the pupil stage. And there's some very well um, disguised um, um, fake caddis pupae on the left. And the ones on the right are also said to be caddis pupae, but they seem to be a bit more basic. Which brings us to enemies. Now, this is one area where we really are very vague about the biology of a lot of caddis. We've got, you know, the traditional enemies, the trout, the dippers. And there's a few specialists which we don't know about. That, that is this, uh, an igneumonid called Acriotypus armatus, and that's the pupil breathing strap 
from um, one of the Gwebid cutters. Uh, and it only goes for certain species. But I, we know quite a lot about that one. But what about generalists, generalists and enemies? And I'm quite interested in these sort of habitats. If these are marshes which dry up in the summer and the caddis in them wouldn't seem to have any enemies. You know, there are not any fish, probably no big amphibia. You know, what, what is there to actually attack them? But yet when you go hunting for the pupae of these things, not only are they in a, a case which looks a bit like the environment, they disguise themselves in a cocoon. They add on extra bits of grass and so on and hide themselves at the bottom of the grass tussock. My suspicion is that they're actually um, trying to avoid these generalist sight um, hunters, crows and blackbirds, both of which are known to hunt down caddis. It's possible that they're against some water beetle larvae, for which with those sickle mandibles can actually penetrate through a case. It might be that it's just protection against drying out. But this, it's an area which we really need to try and find a lot more about. And we have problems. When I arrive at a water body, what happens? Well, the birds fly away. So when I ask the question, oh, well, I didn't see any birds. Meanwhile, on the other side, the bird watchers are saying, I wonder what those birds are eating. It certainly dippers have been seen to, to be uh, feeding on things. You might think, well, what insects are they eating? Well, fortunately, Dippers, dip, as I'm told, have poos in certain areas, so we can collect the poos and do DNA work on them. But for most birds, a bit more difficult. Imagine this is, is the project you're actually given. I mean, you're just not going to find bird poos easily. But let's have a look at some of the usual suspects for a premature caddis death. Fungi, bacteria, virus. And I will include just a couple of ones which um, many caddis workers will be familiar with, just to explain them. In streams, you'll often turn a stone over and you'll find lots of caddis, which are um, they're just generally regarded as being, well, you know, they must have got damp and died and gone and got, you know, the mildewy. The probability is that it's actually this um, fungus related to the fungus which attacks flies, Entomophila muscae, in the same group, probably called Avinia rhizospora. And this is it. It's a desperate fungus. You can actually light trap caddis and they will fly in to the light trap. And then a few hours later, when you look at them, their abdomen is already um, swelling as this fungus takes over and, and, uh, and, and blows them up. The one which other people who were the study larvae will be uh, very familiar with, you'll get some which look as though some of them can look like a sheep. And they're covered in these, in these um, tiny little white uh, protozoa related to a vorticella called uh, Astalis. Not a parasite at all. It's just making use of the fact that the respiratory currents of the caddis larva um, will carry food to, to uh, them. I was interested that, I mean, uh, it was a subject which nobody was really interested in, insect um, ailments, but there's a, that, that special interest group now at the Royal Ensoc. With a lot of biology to um, potentially observe, I wonder what um, uh, potentially recorders might contribute. So for that, I decided I would ask my friend Sharon Flint for her views. Now, Sharon is, um, is setting up, and it's in its early days, um, so it's still developing, but this caddisfly group at the Freshwater Biological Association. So I asked Sharon what um, she was hoping this group might actually achieve. Well, I'm hoping it achieves more enthusiastic um, caddis recorders and people who want to know, not just put a dot on a map, but know more about the whole life histories. Yes. I hope, you know, so hopefully people will start contributing themselves with their own observations which would be absolutely smashing, wouldn't it? Um, so every little helps, as somebody said. Um, so that's all you can do, hope to inspire people with the content we're putting on, and hopefully they'll get involved as much as possible. And eventually, when all this coronavirus business comes to an end, hopefully, 
and we're all safe again, we can all get out in the field together at some point, which would be marvellous. Yeah. I think what impresses, what, what impresses me is shown is that um, it's the sort of community approach, um, oh. which, which this exemplifies, I think, um, and that uh, it isn't just um, a sole recorder of their own battling away. Um, you can all benefit um, from um, interaction. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. We can't be everywhere, can we? That'd be wonderful to have a network of county recorders even, so yeah. that, you know, we, we, they can go off and do their own thing around their local area. That is true. And then we all meet up virtually or however, and, and we can say, you know, these are, this one's data deficient. It's been found in this place so many years ago, yeah. and they can go and have a look in their own area. Yes. And that'd be wonderful, you know, join it all up all over the country. Yeah. So, I mean, if effectively, uh, because the two questions I asked you would be what would encourage more recording and what would uh, discourage it? And obviously, discouragement would be, well, lack of community, a lack of feeling that, 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 that it was worthwhile. Um, yeah, and uh, yeah, you have to have good communication uh, all the time, yes. you know, and be, you know, just be really helpful, as, as helpful as you can be, even if you're not quite sure how to answer something for someone, at least people know you're listening yeah. and that you're interested and that their opinion matters on, on whatever they're trying to do for Cadiz. Okay. So having got an idea about the Caddis Flying Club and what it might achieve, that did get me thinking of one side problem which we need to put thought to. Um, we're going to be gathering a lot of information, but how do we store it? And in the past, the um, Victorian journals were full of lots of casual observations. They were welcome, printing was cheap, and they're lovely things to read. But then it became oh a bit you know it was all very expensive and and we didn't want these uh, casual observations any, anymore. And then we've got the early twenty first century, where we're now moving strongly towards blogs. But what I, I do worry about blogs, about you know do we need a permanent hard copy, which is why the journals such as that produced by the by the BEN NHS are very valuable. Um, so, but there's a way of somehow harvesting these, this um, large amount of new material, new um, uh, information we might be getting, and finding a way of permanently um, uh, archiving it. But it wasn't the only reason casual observations fell out of favour. You have to be careful about single observations. I've tried to summarise that up in this sort of, in this, you know, in the sort of experience of this mythical moth, which eventually people have been searching for for years, and eventually somebody found the caterpillar, and there it was, and they thought that's what it does. But of course, the other caterpillars of the same species were not uh, were not at all impressed. So I have to be careful not to give the wrong impression, apart from a single um, observation. And I'm looking. Well, not looking forward, but I'm anticipating I will experience the things exactly the same way. It took my wife and myself four person hours at Winbury Moss to find one egg mass of this caddis. Actually, it's not particularly rare there, so we were baffled why it took us so long. We found it under the moss covering tree roots. And although we indicated it was one egg mass found at that time, we're just w wondering just how long before we start seeing in press the eggs are laid under moss covering tree roots? Were they in more um, less accessible microhabitats? Which brings us on to this, on to publications of a, diff of a similar sort. These status reviews are possibly, well, they're essential tools in the designation of SSSIs. The Caddis Review here was completed in 2016 and the next one is not due until 2026. So I was concerned to find ways to keep these updated and ask Mike how, how this might be done. I was perhaps hoping for a slightly different answer actually from Mike. Attention 
um, of the agencies, I believe, is to review them every 10 years. But given the task in hand and the available finances, I'm still and the other and my colleagues are still having to rely on statuses that are about 30 or 40 years old for some taxonomic groups. So from my perspective, the key thing is really to get a more comprehensive coverage of, of all invertebrate taxonomic groups before there are repeats. That would be the ideal. But, uh, you know, I, I'm not a person of great influence, so uh, I think I think the, the periodicity is still supposed to be 10 years. And I think that Natural England at the moment are looking to uh, repeat the reviews they did for dragonflies and butterflies, which are 12 years old. Um, so, so, so some people are looking at this decadal review, whereas I think, you know, the, the want for so sort of the the invertebrate ecologist within the agency is to have a lot more done in a more contemporary fashion rather than having to rely on spaces that are, are really old and out of date now yeah okay i was um well a little bit um uh, downtrodden by that but uh, i use it as an example um this particular species, Agacella spiculicornis. To ask Mike how you would deal with the situation of this in his day-to-day -day work. Agacella filicornis. Now, when that was, when we had been unable to find that anyway, you very kindly encouraged myself and my uh, wife Brenda to go and look for it at the Welsh sites and we duly found it in the Welsh sites and it's now been found again at the Scottish site and it's been found um, at some other sites in Scarborough so it can no longer really justify its endangered status I think it's always going to be vulnerable being uh, uh, just a few popular populations but um, uh, you will be still be um, you know, presumably, um, until the next review, every time its name's mentioned, it's going to be down as um, an endangered species. Is that correct? It, it is, yes. So I, I would, until uh, a, re, a repeat review is done, it is officially endangered. So I would use that. But um, if I came, none of the none of the Adicella Villacorna sites in Wales are actually SSIs yet, mm. unfortunately. But we, even if your status were reduced to vulnerable, then we could still designate sites for that particular cadence, which I would be keen to do. So it's a, a rare enough species to be represented in the SSI series. So whether it's reached from endangered to vulnerable really doesn't matter that much because the uh, revised SSI guidelines allow you to select for species that are, uh, are, are endangered or vulnerable in the same way. So that doesn't impact too much. What I tend to do though, is if, if I had a concern that the status was, um, uh, what's the right word, improving, I suppose, if the status was improving, so it looked like uh, recent data post review suggested that the species was more widespread, I would always temper any evaluation um, in terms of designating a site or, or using that species as a flagship in conservation terms with more statuses are used for a multiplicity of purposes. And at the moment I am, um, and in the Welsh Environment Act, there is the, um, uh, an update of what is the Section 7 list, which Welsh governments and other bodies have a duty to conserve. And at the moment, I am um, preparing a list, a revised list of, species, of invertebrate species that should be on that, le that list. And, and one of the criterion, one of the criterion is, um, is GB status. And uh, it's been discussed that, the, part that the, the likelihood is that that list, a major part of the list, will be will comprise those that are critically endangered, endangered and vulnerable. 
So the, the review, the, the status reviews have more a much wider significance than SSI um, designation or notification. It was a rather bad line to Anglesey, uh, where Mike lives, but later he said that these species of clowns are probably the most significant contribution amateur invertebrate patrollers can make to species conservation is by contributing data to enable these species conservation species accounts to be written. Now, updating them, okay, fair enough. It, it, it counts only four years old, clearly has lower priority for conservation than updating accounts that are decades old. So it's not a priority, but Craig uh, McAdam and myself think it would be useful to, to be getting reviews ready for the 2026 review. And that also, perhaps we might worth and discussing updating procedures with JNCC, I suppose I'm becoming slightly political here. You know, I mean, to get more current information available, you know, perhaps we could chip away at these the ones that are 30 or 40 years old. While I'm on the subject of this, um, of updating, I would certainly like to really praise um, the web page in the um, uh, Tanitra project, which is deals with um, updating um, their, how up-to-date data sets are on the NBN and what species groups have had a post-2000 species review. At that stage, it was worth saying, well, I wonder what recorder motivation is because I'm just starting to get a bit worried about um, all the possible things we might ask a recorder to do. How do we maintain their, their interest? You know, when I feel I've had enough of Caddis, and this does occur for a few minutes each year, I know a chat with Sharon Flint will lift my spirits. I sprang the question on, on Sharon, probably a bit unfairly, um, because it didn't give her a chance to, to uh, really um, compose a careful reply, but um, a very good reply I got. And it's a philosophical one here, and I, I just like your, 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 your views, and I, I am springing it on you. What do you think is the main motivation people have for recording? Is it that oh. they're assisting conservation, or is it that it's actually an interesting thing to do? Do you know well, that's a hard one, because yeah. mm -hmm. uh, there's, lots of different, oh, there's lots of different things that motivate people. And um, what motivates me? Um, I'll just say what motivates me first and then try to figure out what motivates other people. For me, and it sounds really sort of fair, airy fairy, but I still, I, I love Cadiz. I, I actually physically, I love them. You know, I mean, it's this, it's, it's curiosity and, you know, what are they doing? You know, I'm, I'm very, very curious like that. So for me, that's what it's about, finding out more about what are they doing? About they, what do they do at night though? How, why are they there? Yeah. You know, that kind of thing. But for other people, I think there's a whole range, a whole multitude of okay. reasons. So some people like to have a certain number of records. You yeah. know, they like to, it's a bit of a competition, I think. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, I've got this many records. I've got that many in a year. Or some people just like to, um, like, I suppose, collecting stamps. I don't know. They like to put dots on maps, which is a very important thing to do. And I'm not dissing that at all. Um, we need, we, but the dots on the maps are an excellent start. Yes. Um, and then we need to think, well, why is that dot there? Yeah. So I'm, I'm interested in not only the dots on the maps, but what is going on there? What's the relationship? Why is that caddis found there and not there? Or is it, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so I think there's, there's the competition sort of type I've got this many records and I record type person. And then there might be a definite genuine, along with that reason, um, which is conservation wise, you know, that a lot of people like to record things that are almost neglected groups, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, let's find out more about them. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I don't know really, I think, I, I'd like to think as well that people just absolutely think they're charming. You know, yes. that caddis, both in their adult yeah. and juvenile stages, are just gorgeous little things. Yeah. And that they're really inspired by them and they're very pretty. I know lots of people do love the juveniles, don't they? 
um, and they love their cases. And, um, you know, but I think it can be quite scary to start thinking about identifying some of the juveniles. Um, yeah. And in, in some ways, the adults can be easier in some ways, I don't know, but there are very distinctive um, mm -hmm. species in both life stages. Um, so I don't know. I'm hoping yeah. that people will start by just thinking they're very pretty. They might be a bit neglected and they want to do recording because of that. So I think we can summarise that by saying that the Caddis group, I'm hoping, could supply ideas. Would always um, discuss with the recorder, but where to record, how to find certain species, aspects of the biology that are especially poorly known. And a lot is still needing to, to, to be found out. Possibly the atlas and the species accounts, I'm hoping will be a reference source for um, the gaps. We could adopt the species. Sharon and Peter Flint have adopted our rarest UK caddis, Archimedes, at Mam and Tom. And I suppose the Wallace family changed their move at the moment. Certainly, I think Eritrea's Esophagus would be one of the things that we're particularly um, uh, studying. Now, gap filling is another traditional role for, um, for um, use of atlases. And I asked Martin Harvey about a new approach from the Biological Record Centre regarding uh, gap filling, which um, seemed very interesting. You know, I mean, traditionally, you would get the atlas, you'd say, gosh, you know, that species has been recorded from there, and, that, and that's close to where I live, I'll go and have a look. But um, I was intrigued by um, the BRC Orthoptera project, which seems to be almost turning it on its head. And instead of looking for, uh, for, uh, for gaps, it's looked for where things have been recorded before. Could you uh, sort of enlarge what the, <laughs> what, what the aspirations of, this, of that uh, project are? Yeah, sure. So, so th this was a, quite a small trial project that, yes, uh, yes. this year. And like so many things, it was intended to be a bigger trial, but um, the, okay. the COVID situation uh, got, in the, way, got yeah. in the way of that. But we, we, did, we did manage to, to run this with um, the grasshoppers and crickets recording scheme and some of the, the recorders involved with that. And I suppose it all comes down to thinking of what types of gaps there might be. And the obvious one, as you've already said, is if you look at an atlas mm -hmm. and there are squares that haven't got a dot on them, there's a clear gap in our knowledge of distribution from that. But the gaps that we were looking at in this particular project were, were more to do with trying to analyze trends over time, yes. uh, which means that you don't, you don't just need a record from a place, you need a record from that place in more than one time period so that you can make an assessment of how things might yes. change. Yes. Mm -hmm. So the, this particular project was highlighting those and it was based on one kilometre squares and it was highlighting the squares where there, there had been one lot of recording done, but nobody had ever been back and done a second or third lot of recording. And we, um, I'm, we're still compiling the results of this to see how interested people were in actually taking part in this sort of approach. But what we were trying to do is always to encourage people to go back and revisit the sites that had been visited in the past. And by doing that, you get a sort of double bonus because not only does the new data come in for analysis, but it enables then us to make use of the old data yes. in this more longer term trend analysis. Yes. And I think that's, I've, I've been, I'm going to be really interested to see what's come out of the trial. Yeah. And next, this, we're hoping that this will lead on next year. We, we have another project starting up yeah. that is, again, really trying to think of where gaps are in the sense. And it all comes back to what you're trying to do with the data. What you see as gaps all depends on what use you're trying to make of the data. Yes. So, for instance, if you were trying to look at, I don't know, let's, well, sticking with caddis flies, let's think about water quality. You might be trying to work out some aspect of um, policy around water quality and what impact that might have on caddis flies. Yes. Um, and what we're hoping to investigate is to whether the existing data can tell us where, not just where the gaps are, but where the most useful gaps to fill yes. 
be to yeah. give us the answers to where is best to think about water quality. I'm not sure if I've explained that very well, but the I and yes, oh yes, I mean the um, that would be excellent guidance because um, many keen recorders they would see a map and they would see lots of holes in it. And um, to be actually suggested, or they would see a few scattering records. But I mean, they have guidance that um, you know. Look, we think going there, there, and there would be very valuable. I think lots of recorders would would welcome that. And um... so that's gap filling. So <laughs> it's been a long talk. So I thought I need to summarise some of the ideas for record um, enhancement all the things to improve um, a record. If you've got the time, add on some of those. And if you're really keen, do others. Be directed to where you might like to, to go. If you've got the opportunity, certainly those are all really worth recording. And case construction would be the thing for a bit of fun that you might like to, to, to note. This is one of the, the best known of all Caddis cases. And in particular, within a, an individual brew, you might get an individual Caddis who likes to say choose shells to make its case, which reminds me of an old joke. A Mollus recorder and a Caddis recorder went into a bar. It was before lockdown, of course. But I can record more Mollus species than you using a net and dredge, said the Mollus recorder, but actually he was wrong. Because in one study, more species were found uh, to have been incorporated by Limnetalus falicornis into their cases than could be found by a net and range. Anyway, the Caddis group will always try and remember that. I mean, that is what we're about, getting the records, really, um, as well as the biology. But we'll always bear in mind a record will always have value. I, was, I like the British Dragonfly um, Society um, approach. You know, whatever level you go in, you can be catered for. From the very basics of the first record you've ever made to studying the uh, biology in detail. British Memory Report I Support Group does the same thing. You know, please tell us your records if you can add on the ecological information that makes them more valuable. User-friendly resources, easy to use guides. We've just written this. Um, it's still available from Field Studies Council on their website. So have, have you got your copy yet? It's mainly trying to treat caddis a little like moths. The more advanced keys will be photographic or multi-access. We'll remember how equipment improves. Those microscopes on the left are well under £100. And the optics are fantastic, I think, even though the magnification is quite poor. But with that, an add on a mobile phone, um, as on the right, and you can get photographs of genitalia. We'll adapt to new tech technologies. I mean, that, I couldn't believe it. That little thing stuck on the end of the mobile phone is a DNA analyzer. But the trouble is, you have to turn your specimen into a puree, and not everybody will want to do that. But then we've, we've got image analysis. That marvellous paper is actually all about identifying beetles from photographs. Mobile phone and the camera. And we'll have a great time until superior beings take over. But until then, carry on recording. Caddis, of course. I'd like to say thanks. That is the end of the formal talk. I'd like to, to, to give thanks to people who appeared in it, Martin Harvey, Craig McAdam, Sharon Flint, and Mike Howe. You know, online lectures don't don't actually allow much instant audience reaction. But I was keen to be able to say that my talk ended with an enthusiastic round of applause. So here it is. OK, I see I've got I have been about four minutes left. Is that, is that, is that right, Sharon? I mean, is, is that right, Kieran? About four, four minutes. So can I show you some live caddis? Yeah, right. Very good. These were collected very close to my home. Um, 
it's in Arrow Park. There's the Red Arrow. Arrow Park, if you, if you don't know it, that was where the, the UK's first COVID isolations were sent. It was in the days when they actually thought that might work. Anyway, from that pond there, in the, uh, little leaves which are, are being chewed by the caddis, and the caddis concerned are just is that one there, Diphotelius pellucidus, it is. And there is a beautiful little Limnophilus caddis. And um, that's, that was photographed just a couple of days ago, walking in, in, in the way that only Limnophilus caddis can. Off you go. Way. Oh, it goes. Right. Okay. And later in the season, if you if you if any of you have ponds which look anything like that, very full full of leaves, look for these big holes which haven't been made by by leaf cutter bees earlier on. It'll be made by cutters to make the kiss, and that's a lovely photograph from you know, a lovely image from Norman Higgins. So later on in the year, notice of great interest on, on the left hand photograph. They eat the oak leaves, but the beech leaves are notoriously unpalatable for lots of freshwater insects. And but they make the cases out of that. And that's the the um, the eggs are laid um, on overhanging um, vegetation. Which gives me a chance for finally to have an advert for a forthcoming and uh, show of mine. Um, it's been delayed by um, COVID, but um, I hope you will enjoy it when it uh, uh, eventually arrives. Okay, and that genuinely, with that dreadful, <laughs> dreadful corny joke, is the end of my talk. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, thank you Ian. Um, we'll give you we'll give you a round of applause a bit a bit later when we can get <laughs> on mute. But the, as David Howden is saying there, there is a way of giving you a virtual round of applause without without um, everybody unmuting. So we'll go straight into the the questions now. Um, we haven't got a lot of time, and I, I'm sure there are lots of questions. So um, if anybody would like to ask a question directly directly to Ian, yeah. then you can raise your blue virtual hand um it is under the participants option um if you start waving your hand i won't see you there's a lot 185 people on this call and i can only see a few of you at a time so please do not wave frantically because other people might see you and i might not right so we've got we've got a couple of hands up straight away um, i'm going to close down my chat so i won't be able to see that so if you've got any questions Put them in the general chat or to Holly directly. Um, Savannah, you've got your hand up. If you'd like to unmute yourself. Hi, um, I had put it to Holly, but I thank you for letting me talk. Um, uh, concerning caddisfly mating, is it possible that caddisflies might sometimes mate in or, or at light traps, for instance? Might explain the swarms of 50 plus silo or similar species that I had in my trap earlier this year. Thank you. Yes, um, the a light trap is is a way where two sexes get uh, close together, and therefore um, uh, it's quite likely they will actually mate um, in, in the light trap. The same thing could happen if you happen to uh, put it to to put a male and female caddis into say a plastic tube, then you know the same thing happens. Sometimes you can actually put different sexes uh, or different species into a plastic tube, and then the male is going to sometimes grab the wrong female. In that respect, yeah, yeah. So certainly. Thank you. Yeah. And we've got Helen, Helen James. Would you like to put your video on and, and unmute? All right. Hi. Um, I was interested in that white fungus that you were finding on the caddis flies. I was wondering if it's always been around historically or if it's become more prevalent in recent times and if it's causing problems to their health, if it's actually damaging them in any way and if it could be more abundant because of pollution or something like that. It would be really interesting to see if it has been around a long time or if it's become much more common. It was just what I was wondering. Thank you. You know, I don't think I can answer that question about whether it's, whether it's become more common. Um, it's, um, 
we know little about it. Um, I don't know exactly when the insects become uh, infected by it. Um, that group fires the spores from, from the dying body, then um, settle on, on the surfaces around them, and they're then picked up by um, others. But um, I can't answer your question about it becoming more, more uh, common. But I'm, I'm equally um, intrigued to know at what stage it actually attacks them. In other words, um, are they, have they laid their eggs? Are they towards the end of their life when that fungus attacks? In which case, it would have less impact than um, uh, if it was when they were um, just about to lay. So yeah, it's, it's an, an intriguing, an intriguing fungus. Yeah. But I can't answer your basic question. I'm afraid I no. Thank you. Okay, uh, John, you're on mute, John. Yeah, um, you know, just wondering, uh, went to had a talk about uh, environmental DNA analysis of water bodies, mm -hmm. and whether this is proving useful in determining what species are there or likely to be useful, and whether or not it would be the end of necessity to, for people to go out and actually do any sampling. Right. Um, EDNA will be increasingly used, and um, it there's a concern it might reduce the uh, amount of um, survey work which which it takes place. But uh, I have not heard people being really confident that it's ever going to be able to give an idea about um, abundances. Um, so you're probably still going to need somebody to go out and, and, and find there. I, I think the uh, use where I think it could possibly be its most useful one that I've heard is say with something like the pearl mussel, where you have very small numbers and you can keep sampling up a river, you know, and, and you get a point, you say, pearl mussel DNA, pearl mussel, no pearl mussel D DNA, and you know that therefore where it is. But having got that good idea, somebody said, but the trouble is pearl mussel shells can leak DNA from the breakdown of the, of the ligaments um, for many years. But it, it's the um, abundance factor, which um, I think is the, is the sort of Achilles heel at the moment um, in uh, um, eDNA work. But generally, it's a very exciting um, prospect. You know, it has a way of adding to what, what, what we, can, we can do um, rather than um, uh, taking it away. But the worry is it'll be used by government as a way of taking away rather than adding to. But that's, again, I've become political there, really. Yeah, thank you. OK, Holly, do we have any questions from the, that were sent to you by the chat function over the, during the course of the? Yeah, we've got a few. So the first one that came in um, from Kat. She was asking, could the citizen scientists recording uh, RMI, so River Monitoring Initiative, have more training to ID CADIS? Because at the moment, they're just recording whether they're cased or caseless. Right. Yes, this, um, it's, it's a, a very good question. Um, I've been involved with the River Flight Monitoring um, uh, Programme for um, a long time. Um, and it's sort of boredom factor comes in, I know, on river fly monitors, um, in that you would long to, to do more. The basics are such a good, it's such a good procedure. It's linked in so carefully with the environment agency that uh, we certainly don't want to be losing something like, like that. But adding on, right, there's some ideas called river fly plus, which are going to be looking at um, extra aspects. But then, there are, I suppose, moving away out of the river fly when we move into things and the courses. I mean, things like um, biolinks would be an idea of, of, of a sort of, sort of body who might run for um, run um, extra courses. The Freshwater Biological Association has ideas of running um, extra courses um, to move people from um, the uh, um, basics up along the ladder. And I think the production of good and easy keys. Um, there is a, a, an easy key produced by Field Studies Council to, to Cladis Larby, and I think we would in, uh, hope to um, improve that. So at the moment, I, 
there isn't like a sort of um, um, you know a clear almost like sort of you know um, career path from a riverfly monitor up to an expert in uh, in, in Cadiz. But um, would hope that would be able to provide um, um, stepping stones on the way. Yeah, right. Thank you. I've got a question from Maria. She was saying, is there a lot of variation in the composition of or fox or however you say it? Terrible pronunciation there, probably. Um, yeah, is there any uh, variation in the composition of them between sites slash habitats? And does that play any part in the distribution of caddis larvae? Very good question. Yes and yes is the answer to that, certainly. Um, it does vary a lot. Um, the reason it lights so much is because it's, it's such a good general term which, which um, covers just what is, is growing on the on, 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 on surfaces. But there's certainly, um, the um, caddis are quite, um, they, the ones who like certain species of uh, diatom will go for that. There are some species of diatom which are a bit um, unpalatable and they will actually choose to go for the, for the right one. So yes, absolutely certainly, um, uh, it varies um, uh, across the area. And, um, it's uh, a very good food source. Where it's particularly valuable, actually, is over the winter time period. Uh, now, there isn't much in the way of, of diatoms growing there, but there's plenty of, of uh, fungi and bacteria, and that can help a lot of cutters. So the whole range of things to sort of um, uh, eke out an existence over winter, grazing this stuff off the rocks. Okay, Matt? Well, thank you. Uh, we've got another question from Kat. And she was asking, why Cadis? What's the value of studying these as opposed to other taxa? Right, they're part of the general um, general ecosystem. Um, they're particularly light for, for their ability to um, show water quality, um, water quality monitoring. Um, uses them at a family level and increasingly at a, at a species level. Um, so that is a way, um, and no, stoneflies and mayflies are used in the um, uh, same way. Um, but they're just part of the, um, of, of the natural world, really. Um, they're obviously um, fed upon by, by birds, by fish and so on. So they're a part of the of the general life cycle. But I think if you had, if they had to really pick up something where they're really valuable and really useful, I would say it is in uh, water quality monitoring. Okay. I think we've got time for maybe one, one, one more question or two more quick questions, Holly. Okie dokie. Um, we've got a question from Steve. He was asking, are there any resources that make it clear what species can be reliably identified in the field and which need a voucher specimen? Right. Um, the simple key to uh, the, the uh, um, aid gap field studies council, simple key to, to Cadiz lobby does try and indicate which ones you, you can do in the field. Um, uh, and by putting them into um, a little teaspoon of water. Um, we're hoping to do the same thing in the adult guide as well, um, to, uh, to, to say what you could do um, in, in the field. But um, as a sort of a list, you know, not a big list of species, you know, this, this, yes, you can, no, no, you can't. But um, yes, yeah, certainly, I think it's absolutely uh, essential. Um, but you see, it varies. Um, the, the microscopes, which, which I was showing there, revolutionized things in many respects you know i mean we were always um uh thinking when it was a hand lens you know the times 10 hand lens that's it you know the acme to your identification but i mean the, the, these days so many people have have the, have the microscopes which not necessarily field ones but there are field microscopes as well okay i'm not sure if i if i fully answered that question but i'll try you did thank you is there time for one more kieran yeah, why not? We'll go over a little bit. Okay. A uh, question from Sam here. They're asking, is there a particular microscope that represents good value for money for someone who's just starting out with Caddis? Right. Well, I would suggest that you um, contact Gabby Hedges of the Tinnitra project um, and ask him 
what the microscopes are which uh, they um, obtain for their uh, project. Um, and I think that will um, indicate one which I think is very good. Great stuff, thank you. I'm aware there are more questions in the chat, but I think they're going to need a bit more of a lengthy answer. So what I'm going to do is save those and send them over to Ian. And then we're going to compile the answers into a blog. So we'll send that around um, next week, I'm guessing, at some point. So I think I see, yeah. oh, it's nice to, to actually see some, some like Savannah, who I know I've, I've met you, Savannah, several times on, on Facebook. And uh, it's nice to actually see you in, 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 in person. And thanks for... Uh, for all your efforts and on that, on that, it's very good. Uh, thank you. I'm learning so much, but I'm not great yet. So thank you so much for your help. I really appreciate it. Oh, it's okay. It's encouraging knowing that there's people out there who are interested. You know what I mean? It's it's mutual, honestly. It's mutual. So so anyway, you know, that, that's pleased to to do you there. And if there's other people who I've met, like John, who I haven't, who I might have, I might or may have not met you in the past. But anyway, John, you know. Okay, right. Yeah. Um, I was just going to add that I've dropped a link in the chat to the Tinnitra Projects web page. So if anybody would like to find out more about the Tinnitra Project and how to get involved, um, it, yeah, the details are there. I was just going to add to that comment about microscopes, Ian, that people can get secondhand microscopes as well. And if you've got any links with a university, universities often throw them away because they've got new ones. So be cheeky, ask your local university if they've got any microscopes that they're getting rid of. You never, be, you, you might be surprised with what you'll get. Uh, I know that the FSC has been offered quite large numbers of them before, so always worth checking with universities and there are secondhand uh, microscope suppliers online and sometimes the older ones are better than the new ones. They don't make microscopes like they used to. Um, on that note, I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to finish the Q&A. Um,